Let me show the cash cards single week. Okay, are we ready? I think we are ready now. Just trying to get this straightened out. Are you live? We are live. All right. We're ready to go. Okay, we are live. Comments will appear here. Okay, we are live, and uh, we're giving you a share tonight. Leila Nishmas Rezek Fruman. Remind me again, what was her Hebrew name? Rachel. Rachel Bas. Shlomo Yoel. Bas Shlomo Yoel. Yoel. Rachel Bas Shlomo Yoel. Uh, she should have a lifting in Gan Eden. We're doing it at her house. It, even it, normally we do it at um, Paul's house. Paul has agreed to uh, to allow it to be at uh, Rezekah Leo Shalom's house. So this shir tonight is in memory of Rezekah, as we said, Rachel Ashlam Ayol, and it's at her house as well. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. If you are watching, if you're enjoying it, please do share so that other people can watch and can see it as well. We already have, you know, we have a lot more people on watching online that are watching this uh, in this room. Thank you for all for joining in. Okay, um, I'm sorry I'm late. Let me just start with this one. I think, you know, it was, a, it was one of these. Have you ever made a mistake in scheduling things really badly? So, <laughs> yes, yes. 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 We, I, I guess everybody, everybody's nodding over here. Being, a, being a personal trainer, I mean, two people turn up at the same okay, time. Okay, you think that's <laughs> bad. I had what's good. <laughs> Of course, we'll trade with two big seven say that. That's that's pretty bad. We had so uh, this week. I, I just I came now from giving a share in German. There's an organization that makes or that does shurim in German now for German speaking people, and I uh, I was able to get myself on the roster of speakers. My father got me on it. He said, "Yeah, you know, you can take uh, take my son. Listen to him. He's got what to say. Also, hopefully." And uh, so we made up for Tuesday night at seven o'clock. So Tuesday night, I'm um, sitting and I'm having supper. And when we have supper, we have a rule, no phones at supper. We put away the phones for supper, which is a good rule. I recommend it to everybody. If you can, no, no phones at supper is always a good thing. So go ahead and no phones. We're sitting, we're eating supper. I'm looking at the watch. It's now 6.30. Got another half an hour to go. We're ready. Amazing. So I get to my phone and I see nine missed calls. And I'm like, nine missed calls? That's not very good. You know? <laughs> who's looking for me so desperately in the last 25 minutes? I've nine missed calls. And I pulled out my phone, and it was like a phone call from the same telephone number. Ten minutes ago, nine minutes ago, eight minutes ago, seven minutes ago, six minutes ago. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And it was this lady that I was supposed to... And I, I finally, I checked, and she left me a message. And it says, 7 o'clock German time, not UK time. So all these people were sitting on their computer waiting for the rabbi to show up to give the shit. At least they didn't come anywhere. But it's like my first time I'm giving this shit. It was just so embarrassing. I'm like, uh, it was like, what am I supposed to do with this? So she called me. Said, all right, you do it tonight. Fine. So we did it tonight right before I came in. That's why we're running late and we're running behind. So I'd like to discuss the following question. I think it's a very important question. We, I wanted to discuss it. We were going to discuss it two weeks ago when Paul asked me. And then it just took time to get everyone together. The question we're asking is as follows. Do Jewish people have a monopoly on suffering? Okay? Uh, it's a question, I think, that very much a post-Holocaust question, where people who had gone through the Holocaust very much suffered in the Holocaust and came out, and afterwards, there was almost like a feeling that, I mean, some people felt, were Jews milking the Holocaust? Were they trying to get the most out of it? Some people almost felt that there was, you're making too much of a fuss. Calm down. What's going on over here? Why are you... You know, and, and we made it, uh, we, you know, quite rightly so. I, think, I don't think it's wrong that we made a big deal of the Holocaust. But I think I'd like to sort of discuss, is there a difference maybe in Jewish suffering between Jewish suffering and any other suffering over the ages, over the generations? And if there is, and specifically as it pertains to the Holocaust, what is that difference and what can we learn from that difference? Okay, so I'm going to open up the question to comments. Can you pour me some water? I'm going to open up the question to comments. Whether you want to make a comment online, I'm going to try to read it. If you want to make a comment here around the table, you're very welcome to make a comment also. What is it, you know, what is it that makes Jewish, is there, you know, is there something that makes Jewish suffering different, special, or is, you know, Jewish suffering the same as any other suffering? Our blood doesn't run any redder than anybody else's. In, in relation to the Holocaust, I think the general standard answer to that is that whilst you've had genocides in Darfur, Rwanda, yes. and all these other places, the thing about the Holocaust was it was specific targeting of a race and religion as right. opposed to a political disagreement due to political reasons. Well, I guess what's called, I think the people, the people will say that the Armenians were, uh, you know, the Armenians were, were what's called, they were the Turks came against the Armenians and they, they, they were, um, the Armenians had an issue. I mean, a lot of other 
nationalities where they... Yeah, uh, they, they just went and killed everyone. Pardon? They just went and killed everyone. Right, as opposed to... Concentration camps, slave camps. Torture, basically. The torture... There were camps. I think if you go back to Yugoslavia, there were camps in Yugoslavia, torture camps and things like that. Um, there were other camps. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big history buff, I must tell you. I'm not, I'm not sort of somebody that can tell you all the different places where different people have, have suffered. But, but, you know, there were concentration camps and other, you know, other I, nationalities I, I, <clears> had that as well. I think that there's always that in the Torah, doesn't it, to say about obviously we'll be, you know, a small nation. And right. Where, you know, where it got to a point of we were expanding and it was, I mean, it's horrible to think that that's the reason why the Holocaust happened. Yeah. I'm not saying that is that, that is the reason. Yeah. But we were, it's in the Torah that we were getting too big. But well, God said we we're getting too big, so then maybe we, maybe we could just you know give a generation a bit more infertility or something. God forbid. But like you know, no, maybe I mean, like you know, this seems a little bit intense. Okay, it's like you know, it's the opposite of quantitative easing. Like you know, we've thrown a lot of money. Saying, so, no, you know? I'm not saying the cause of that is God. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying yeah. is that though these kind of things that happen to Jewish people, are, yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say it because I don't really, I don't fully understand it. But I'll, Divine, in a way? you yeah, know, there's okay. There's there's a divine issue. There's a divine side to it. Yeah. Obviously, there'd be a divine side to it, which we're gonna have to speak about. But we, do we? You know, I think the problem is, I think nowadays that that, that the whole I've had a whole long discussion with Gideon Leventhal about this. He said he had been to Yad Vashem and he had uh, he'd done a lot of studying in Yad Vashem about the Holocaust. And I think the the whole narrative, almost in a lot of these places, have changed. Okay, only when I met a Roma Jesus advisor I realized that we don't only teach part of the Holocaust. And yes, we... Have you mean we do or we don't have it, one on it? You're saying you met a Roma Gypsy survivor, so that would mean if you teach the Holocaust, then we, we, don't, we don't have a monopoly on it. Not that we do have a monopoly on it. I think it's the fact that it's a consistency. It's not just the Holocaust. Mm. Okay, Correct. so there yeah. is definitely there's yeah. definitely what we say a consistency. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There is a there's a consistency to it. You know, you can yeah. you go through Jewish history, you will find time and time again that you know that we were you know we're persecuted. You can go back you can see we we've always been when we kicked off of your land, we came back, we got kicked off the land again. And the Romans, Bar Kokhva revolt. You have so many different things that happen. It's very very hard to turn around and to say, well, there's only yeah. But on the other hand, does that give us a monopoly? Does that give us a right to turn around and to say, do you know what? We as Jewish people suffered. And everyone was like, yeah. Like, and therefore, you know, what are we, are we trying to make people feel bad? Like, you know, as I'm saying, I was trying to say before, I mean, nowadays, it, when we get easy, back to, we, now, nowadays we have it easy. As in, we have anti, there's anti-Semitism, yeah, I get yeah. that. But compared to, well, compared to 70, 80 years ago, that we, you know, it was... Uh, no, I'm saying that nowadays, that compared yeah. to... Um, what, Syria? Syria, you know, what's going on there with... East the Africa with, with, yeah, with, uh, right. with the hunger. So, I mean, you know, these people are going through it now. You know, right. It's, 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 it, I believe sometimes they have it because they don't have an easy life. No, they um, don't. Much worse than what we do. Some, yeah, definitely definitely nowadays. I mean, we live a, we live a very cushy life here in England. I, I would turn around and say that there's a, you know... How many people are as blessed as we are? They usually say it for two reasons. It's firstly, yeah. that it shouldn't happen again because we had a cushy life beforehand and it turned around so quickly. And secondly, because of Israel, a justification to make sure that you know we, we need a land where we can be protected. Right. So it's not that we try and make everyone feel bad. It, it's with a, a reason in mind. So what you're saying that when people went ahead and people said that Jews have a monopoly on suffering, they weren't really what they were trying to really do is they were trying to get to another they were trying to get to something else by doing that yeah. which was they were trying to get protect themselves protect themselves in yeah. saying what in saying the fact that look what happened previously look what's right. always happening to us <coughs> yes we need to make sure this doesn't happen again right and also we need a homeland that can protect us right okay we can't rely on anyone else right okay because so i can i can hear that where people turn around and say like you know it's not that we have a monopoly on suffering but we're trying to play our cards in a way that people will be willing to that we can try at least to get out of this issue in creating as many barriers as we can to either anti-semitism or as you said within the land of israel being hopefully a barrier that that could save us mm. right but is there any is there anything else like you know we I as i was saying that with the narrative in in, in yandra shem has changed very much it's turned almost okay Gideon has just said something. It's a long, that's a, that's a long thing. I can't even read the whole thing. Gideon. Was it? Say Gideon Leventhal. Oh, 
Jewish response to evil and suffering is a complex issue, and Jewish responses are often melded between what has happened, the human perspective, mixed with a trust, and whatever happens to earth is ultimately according to God's plan. That is true, but you know, but we're, we're the question that still remains is, you know, very often we are portraying ourselves as <coughs> the people that are always persecuted. But we're not always the... I mean, we've been... the lo- It's the longest-running hatred. Yeah. What was that terrible Woody Allen joke? I went to an equal opportunity camp. I was beaten by all races and creeds equally. You know? <laughs> yeah. That was... As I said, it's not, it's not... It's not of his better jokes. But I guess Woody Allen's a Jew. He can, he can poke fun at this kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Here, pass me a bit more drink. Yeah. So I'm... Uh, but I think I would like to give a different perspective. This is a perspective that I thought about, and I, I just wonder what you think of this idea. Uh, you might agree with it. You might disagree with the idea. But I can't leave my watch behind. I left it in the other place. Okay. Just trying to keep an eye on the time also. There's an idea that I thought of that I, uh, I don't know if you agree with this idea. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, and I'm very happy for you to disagree with this idea. But I think if I were to look at a perspective on suffering, specifically at this perspective on suffering, I, I would turn around and say this is, the, this is one of the issues. Meaning as follows. Of course we're not the only ones that have suffered. And that's what I'm saying. In Yad Vashem, the narrative is almost changing because it's, it's becoming more about tolerance, more about what humanity has done to humanity as opposed to what humanity has done to the Jews. Somebody recently told me, so if you were to look at, I think Gideon said this one also, if you were to look at the percentages, the percentages of gypsies that were killed in the Holocaust were even higher than the percentage of Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. They really, you know, they did away with a lot of these people. A lot of all these people. So you turn around and you say, so when then we as Jews, what, you know, what gives us the right to claim almost, we claim the Holocaust as our own, mm-hmm. but it's not, but I think, if I were to go ahead and if I were to look at one perspective within the Holocaust and to say, this is what might make Jewish suffering different, and the Gemara speaks about this already, and the, but I, I think is the following. The Gemara says the word Sinai, also, even though it doesn't spell like that, connects with the word Sinah, hatred. And that there's a hatred that is connected to the Torah. The fact that we have the Torah and the fact that people hate us, there's a connection. It was interesting, when I was, uh, when I was in, what would it be? In this, I guess it's year 10. When I was in year 10 in high school, so we all had to write a, an essay in history. And the essay that I chose at the time is the reason for anti-Semitism. And my teacher, is always a bad idea. I've done this a few times, and it's never a good idea. When you're writing an essay, you're supposed to write an essay, and your teacher says, I think here's a good place to look for information. Note, look there for that information and include it in your paper because he's giving you a freebie. If you don't include it, I did the same thing in university. In university, our professor, we were doing some kind of research paper, and the professor says, oh, I think it's important to include the research from X, Y, and Z. We didn't include it. They, they really took us to task for not including the research from X, Y, and Z because they felt it was important. Whether it was really relevant or irrelevant was, a, was, was not the point. He's your professor. And if he says this is a relevant piece of information, you've got to know that in order to write a good paper, you're going to have to include that piece of information. So I had one of these things called what's the reason for anti-Semitism? And there was a shift in the reason for anti-Semitism over the years. So that if we go back to time immemorial, and all the way through the generations, what would you say the reason for anti-Semitism was up to the 1800s, almost? What would it be? Based on one word, religion. Anti-Semitism the whole way through was based on religion. You killed our God, deicide, whatever you're going to call it, and therefore, (coughs) whether it was Christian anti-Semitism, whether it was Islamic anti-Semitism, it was again and again hatred against the Jews and what they stood for. And there was something that happened in the 1800s in Germany that then ended up happening all around. What was that? It started maybe even in the 1700s and then moved into the 1800s. What happens in the 1700s in Germany, France, etc., etc.? There was what's called the Emancipation. And once the Emancipation came around, what happened was the Jews that were for years and years and years stuck in the shtetl and they all looked like the shtetl Jews, and you had the long payas and long beards, etc., etc. Nevertheless, you still had 
it, I mean, not nevertheless, people looked like that for ages, for generations, for centuries. And then the Enlightenment comes along. And once the Enlightenment comes along, suddenly the Jews are allowed out of the ghetto. And the Jews are allowed into the universities. And the Jews are allowed to get regular jobs. And the Jews are allowed to become doctors and lawyers and bankers. And now suddenly the Jews become important people within their respective communities, where for many, many years they were just shunned and thrown into the shtetl. And now you have people showing hatred to Jews. And then you turn and you say, well, why do they hate the Jews? Is it because of their religion? But does it really make sense at the moment to say that they hate the Jews because of their religion? Those Jews were Reform, conservative, secular. They had thrown off. A lot of these Jews, and you'll see this even in the Holocaust, you have Jews that are only a quarter Jewish. You have people that they were only a quarter Jewish. They might have one Jewish grandparent, and in Halacha they might not have even considered Jewish. right? And yet, they were persecuted as Jews. right? These were people that went to church on a Sunday. They, they might have been wearing a cross around their neck. These are people that saw themselves as Christian, right? And yet, they got killed. Yet, they got murdered in the Holocaust. And the hate almost shifts. It shifts from being a hatred of... It shifts from being a hatred of religion how much to a hatred of race, right? We don't like Jews because we don't like Jews. Yeah, they were doing mission, as you're saying. They were doing, yeah, that's the Mishling, that's right, that's, they, were, they were mixed together, they were a bit of, bit of each. But there was a hatred now of race as opposed to religion. And it seems almost that the Holocaust comes from a hatred of race more than a religion. However, if you look at something that Hitler said, there's a very, very important point that Hitler said, and that, that is something that I think comes back, that even there is a hatred of race, there was still a very important quote, I didn't bring the quote with me, I should have brought the quote with me, we could always look for it. But the quote is something that says something as follows. Hitler writes in Mein Kampf, and I don't quote Mein Kampf very often, but I will quote it to you over here. He writes, The Jew has inflicted two sins upon humanity. The first sin that he has inflicted on humanity is a sin on the body. The fact that he has inflicted upon them brismila, that they go now and they do it, and he's inflicted a sin on their soul because he's given humanity a consciousness. A conscience, sorry. The Jew has given humanity a conscience. If you look back, if we, you know, nowadays, what people, today it's called Western morality. But before Western morality, what was the name that was given to it? Judeo Christian ethics. And before Judeo Christian ethics, what was the name that was really given to it? Jewish ethics, right? Because Christianity only came along at the year zero. We were there for another over a thousand years before Christianity ever came along. Right? This was our ethics before Yoshke walked onto the, you know, before he ever walked the planet. These were our ethics for over a thousand years. So these are Jewish ethics. And what Western ethics, what Western morality is built on today is really built on what we as Jews have believed for a thousand of years. And he says the Jew has done this. He has given the world a conscience, and therefore he needs to be eradicated. That conscience that they've given the world needs to be eradicated. And I think therein lies a tremendous difference. Most of the time, when you look at people, and you say there's a race hate, or there's a hate of religion, etc., etc., it comes almost with a negative connotation. The Jew is terrible, he's this, he's that. Here, Hitler is saying, the Jew has done something terrible by being good, right? They're so good that they're giving the world a conscience. They're so good that they made the world behave in a way that the world shouldn't behave. What happened to survival of the fittest? What happened to military strength? What happened to the way people should be behaving? That's all out the window. What are they playing this good, this goody two-shoes for? No good. And we need to get rid of them because they are the world's conscience. That, I think, is an interesting thing. When you talk about monopoly on suffering, you don't talk monopoly in pain. But our pain is greater than the pain of people in Darfur, as you mentioned, or the people in Rwanda, or the people in Yugoslavia, or the people in Cambodia. Can we honestly say... So what are you going to start saying? 
well, we had gas chambers. And so they had other things, you know. There are plenty of other ways to torture people. God forbid anybody should ever be tortured. But there are plenty of ways to torture people. And we are not the only people in this, in this world that have been tortured. We cannot claim a monopoly on that. The only thing that we can maybe say is the following. We have been persecuted for what we believe in. And persecuted not only for what we believe in, but sometimes persecuted in the fact that we believe in goodness. And people have turned around and said, we don't like the goodness you believe in. We don't like the fact that you're too good. We're going to get rid of you. Right? And I think almost if you look today at the modern form of anti-Semitism, which people are calling what? Anti-Zionism. Right? What is that all based on? Now think about it. Why is Israel being held to a higher standard than any other nation in the world? We have the most moral army in the world, and yet the world turns around and says, you're shooting civilians. Well, you think Britain would have acted so much better? Have you ever heard Colonel, anybody heard Richard, Colonel Kemp? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Excellent. He speaks very, very well. And he's somebody that works, he's an army man. And he says, I've been part of the army, I know how it works. Don't you tell me that the Israeli army didn't take extra precautions, didn't try their hardest to make sure to ensure there were no civilian casualties. But that's how it goes. And we're being held to a higher standard. People are saying, you think you're so good, and we think you're so good. And that's why we're going to hold you to a higher standard, and we're going to hate you for your goodness. Not for the bad inside of you, but the fact that you're good. Yeah? And that makes, I think, an interesting... That that makes it very, very different. makes things very different. And I think that's really why... When I talk about monopoly on suffering... That's why I don't like talking about pain. That's not, that's, you know, when you're talking about the Holocaust, and that's why, say, we Jews went through a Holocaust. True. So did the Gypsies, so did the Roma, so did many other people. So did the people in Darfur, so did the people in Cambodia, so did the people in Rwanda, so did the people in Yugoslavia. They all <coughs> went through different amount of pain. But there's only one difference that we can point to. And we can say, our suffering comes from a different source. And therefore, if our suffering comes from a different source, and that is really the source of our suffering, that's what we need to figure out. And we need to say, if we are suffering because people look at us and say, you think you're so good, we're going to show you you're not so good, then if we also need to believe that. If the world believes we are better, we also need to turn around and say, we need to be better. We need to be bigger. We need to be better people. That's, that's what you have to do. You have to, and that's, I think, one of the lessons of the Holocaust. There are many, many lessons of the Holocaust. I think people, what, what, you know, what people make the mistake in, with the Holocaust is they want to know reasons for the Holocaust. And I find when you start looking for reasons in the Holocaust, you're going to end up being very, very frustrated. Because, who knows? Are you ever going to be able to really get a reason for the Holocaust? You might be able to guess. You might be able to say, I think it's for this reason, I think it's for that reason. But until you are God... You'll never know the honest reason for the Holocaust. Yeah? The only thing we can say is, but what can I learn? What lessons are there to be learned from the Holocaust? And if we're going to take the lesson and learn the lesson from the Holocaust, I think this is the lesson that I, I feel is very, very important. And when we talk about monopoly, the lesson has to be being better. Everybody else is holding you to a higher standard. Everybody else is saying, we hate you because you think you're better. We hate you because maybe you are a little bit better. We have to turn and say, yes. We have to hold ourselves to a higher moral standard. We have to hold ourselves to a standard where we say, yes, you know what, as Jews, we expect better from ourselves. Not that people are no good. That's not what I'm saying. You know, people say, oh, all, the, all these rabbis think that, like, you know, you, you think you're, you, you, you know, you think everybody else is no good. I don't think everybody else is no good. And I think that people that turn around and say, everybody else is no good, you've got it wrong. We don't, don't step on other people. Don't make yourself great by making other people bad. It's interesting. Sud Rahman just writes. He once asked an Arab Israeli why Jews were hated so much. And he said, because you were given the Torah and you don't live up to it. And that's what we're saying. 
We're given the Torah and you don't live up to it. You don't live up to this higher standard of morality. We expect this higher standard of morality. And we, as Jews, should expect this higher standard of morality of ourselves also. That's what we need to do. If we need to take a lesson, we need to take the lesson of you need to be better. Because? Because the world wants you to be better. Because God wants you to be better. Because you want to be better. Not in a form of one-upmanship. Again, I'm making this very, very clear. This is not about trying to show everybody else, oh, I'm better than so-and-so. It's not I'm better. We hold ourselves to a higher standard. And if you hold yourself to a higher standard and you make sure that you are better, then you can say, we have a monopoly. What do we have a monopoly on? We learn our lesson. The suffering comes for a reason. And we try to learn the lesson from that suffering and to put it into practice and to make something positive out of our suffering. If you just stand there and say, oh, we suffered, so did other people. No, but we suffered for a reason. We understand the reason and we become better people because of that reason. Then, then you can turn around and say, okay, I understand. Now there's something to talk about your suffering. Now there's something unique about Jewish suffering because Jews have become better people because of the suffering. Jews have become more caring people because of the suffering. Jews go out and help. You know, you look at the Israelis and they're always the first ones to any crisis. The, you know, landslides and floods in Haiti and around the world, wherever you are, they're always the first ones there and we should be proud of that. We should be proud of that. Of us being the first ones there. Because our suffering takes us and makes us better people. Makes us different people. Makes us understand that we need to hold ourselves to higher standards. That's what we can say that we have a, that we have a monopoly on suffering. That's the only way we can say that we have a monopoly on suffering. To become better, to become bigger, and become better Jews. Okay? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for everybody who joined us live. Hoodie, thanks for joining us. And now we're finished. <laughs>